Hello, welcome. Today I'm going to talk about coercive controllers as bosses. <laughs> um, I'm Diane Simboro of uh, Thrive After Family Violence. I am a survivor of family violence and for the past 10 years I've been helping other women to go from surviving to, to go on and thrive. Um, so co coercive control is not just what happens in intimate partner relationships behind closed doors. Um, coercive controllers are present in every profession, every social strata, every ethnicity, every, even every religion. So what do you look for? What signs do you look for? And I found a great example on Netflix. I was watching a mini series called Catching Killers. And the episode I'm talking about is called True Lies, The Happy Face Killer. So if you want to watch that, it's really of interest, okay? It started with the discovery of the body of Tonya Bennett, um, or they call Tanya, or whatever you want to call her, and the confusing investigation that followed. Um, confusing because it involved a grandma in her 60s um, named Laverne Pavlinak, who came forward and suggested that her younger abusive boyfriend might be responsible for the murder. And to keep the story short, um, she and her boyfriend offered four eyewitness scenarios about the murder, and all of them were vastly different scenarios. So it raised more questions than answers, okay? But the final bizarre scenario put Laverne in the role of the murderer. And although she doesn't say directly, I did it, when she said, I feel like it's my fault, she had just talked herself into a murder, okay? Uh, the words, I feel like it's my fault, um, is something that many survivors of violence and coercive controllers will say in their confusion about what just happened to them, how it happened. Many feel like they must have done something to trigger off the violence or abuse towards them. So for me, when I hear those words, when I hear a woman say, um, when I hear those words, I, I kind of like, it's like I'm hearing a woman say, I don't understand what just happened. And it's a red flag that indicates an abuser who's managed to displace the blame for his own actions onto the shoulders of his victim. That's what I hear. Um, so enter, enter the stage is uh, Deputy DA Jim McIntyre. Uh, DA is uh, District Attorney. He was tasked by his boss, the district attorney, to, in his own words, this is a quote, get on it. To get the investigation moving, he regarded me as someone who was a bit reckless, a little bit over the edge, someone who would start directing people and pushing people around to get things done in a certain way. So even though there were more questions uh, than answers in the eyewitness statements, the final confession gave McIntyre what he wanted, a guilty party whom he, he could arrest, okay? He put a stop to any further investigation and demanded the arrest of Laverne and her boyfriend, okay? Laverne hugged, listen to this, Laverne hugged her arresting officer when he put her in her cell, okay? Now that alone should have said something. She said that all she had wanted was to be free of her abusive boyfriend who had threatened her life and the lives of her family members. So as strange as it seemed, this was her solution and she was relieved to be safe. But before her trial, she did recant her confession. Her confession. However, they were both convicted and jailed based solely on that confession. Yeah. McIntyre's response was the fact that she wanted to recant her, recant her confession was not surprising at all. He said, this is a quote, Laverne had those investigators charmed. Not only did she have them charmed, but she had control of them with, without anybody realising it. I think that maybe at one point he was slightly the victim of a Stockholm Syndrome. End of quote, okay? So notice carefully his use of the words, she had control of them without them realizing it, okay? He dismissed his investigators concerned about the con contradictory evidence and pointed at them conceding control to their suspect. Someone else had to be wrong, it couldn't be him. So McIntyre was clearly a man who prized 
having control. Okay. Three years later, letters started arriving from a person claiming to be the happy-faced killer who claimed to have killed Tonya Bennett. Okay. Um, they called him the happy face killer because um, in his letters he used to put little happy faces all over the letters. Um, McIntyre chose to ignore the letters and dismissed the author of the letters as a person who was attention seeking. Hmm? Completely just dismissed them. He found factual accuracies and inaccuracies in the letter and that was enough for him to, to think that was warrant for dismissal. He believed the journalist who, who was jumping on board and covering the story was doing it only so he could get a wide readership. He wanted publicity, not because there was merit in the story. So again, he discounted it. And because the two people he had in jail had implicated themselves in some way, there was nothing that he felt could convince him that he had convicted the wrong people. It's a bizarre story. The story that everyone else was trying to tell McIntyre did not fit the story he had chosen. And he was irritated that people wouldn't get on board with his story and forget their own. That is classic coercive control. The journalist uh, involved was also receiving the letters from the, the murderer. In his first letter, the happy face killer stated that Tonya Bennett was his first victim of five at that stage. Um, the journalist did do the fact checking of each of the four other cases and had confirmation of facts that hadn't even been released to the public. So genuine facts. Um, but when he got to Tonya Bennett's case, um, he saw the case was extremely shaky. Um, each time Laverne gave a story, it turned out to be false. And he didn't know why the investigators had pursued Laverne and her boyfriend as the killers because everything turned out to be false. There was no forensic evidence. That's what he found. Um, he also found that the convicted male um, had pled no contest to the, uh, to the accusation only in order so that he could avoid the death sentence, not because he was guilty, but because he wanted to avoid the death sentence. Okay. So McIntyre's response this is another quote. As far as I was concerned, this case was closed and done. But the district attorney thought these letters could be a problem. Okay. And about the articles written by the journalist, McIntyre said, I thought it was nonsense. So he's dismissing everything. One year later, a man called Keith Jesperson was arrested for another murder, and that was when he confessed to eight murders. His DNA was taken, and the DNA, and it was compared to the DNA on the stamp on the letter to sent to McIntyre's investigators, and it matched Jesperson's DNA. Okay, McIntyre's response again, it's it's incredible. This is another quote. I don't know what he's up to, but he's engineering something. So he's always blaming everybody else for, you know, like everybody has um, a manipulation behind this and um, no one's, you know, no one's doing the right thing. You know, he's, he's blaming everyone, displacing blame onto everyone's shoulders. He was again sceptical because it was a problem for his version of the story to be questioned, to be put into question. That was a terrible thing for him. He's a coercive controller. He doesn't like being questioned. So McIntyre eventually met with Jesperson's lawyer who told him that Jesperson wanted McIntyre to know he was responsible for the murder. McIntyre said, the, another quote, I'm so tired of hearing this about your client in this case. This whole thing is ridiculous. Yeah, the lawyer told him, Jim, you really need to listen to this. You need to listen to what I have to tell you. This is important. I believe my guy. So coming from a lawyer that McIntyre knew personally, that was one of the first times he thought, and this is another quote, shit, this could be a problem. It could be that, um, like, um, it could be that the, the people we've convicted might not have done this crime. So first time he was starting to realise, hang on a minute, maybe this story is actually true. Finally, they found irrefutable evidence that Jesperson was indeed the killer of Tonya Bennett. 
finally. McIntyre finally had to admit his mistake, but, and listen to this, he displaced blame onto Laverne Pavlinak's shoulders saying, in fact, this was the beginning of my growing anger at Pavlinak because every killing after Tonya Bennett may have been prevented if the investigation would never have been sidetracked in 1990. Hmm. So the reality is, when I looked at all of this, the reality is McIntyre wanted the case solved and was the one who pushed for the arrest, even though there was a lot of question. So he chose to ignore the wildly contradictory eyewitness statements and final confession. He also chose to ignore the lack of forensic evidence the concerns his investigators had about the authenticity of the statements and confession and their desire to pursue the investigation further. He ignored all of that. He chose to ignore the fact checking done by the journalist on the five cases and his coercion, his um, McIntyre's coercion of his investigators to discontinue any further investigation and close the case certainly contributed to the other, uh, the other murders that followed. You know, um, I hope you can see the, the clear signs of coercive control in that story, because I could. <laughs> when someone is in a position of authority, the result can be devastating because their reach is, is not just one person. Their reach is far, far, um, far wider. You know, it, it impacts many people's lives, not just one person's life. Um, but it's no less or no greater than one person being affected by coercive control either. Um, it's damaging. It's damaging. That, um, in summary, uh, this uh, as another of my uh, videos contributing to, or will, which will culminate on White Ribbon Day 2021. I hope this is helpful for you. Please leave a comment and follow me so you don't miss another live. And remember, it, uh, remember, recovery takes place just one step at a time. Thank you for joining me. See you next time. Bye.